the world keeps getting more interesting, doesn't it? In the dark morning hours of January 12th, 2024, the United States and the United Kingdom engaged in a large bombing campaign against Houthi rebels in Yemen. The impetus for this was a growing crisis in the Red Sea that started two months earlier and that, over time, evolved to threaten the global economy as a whole. A pretty remarkable feat for an upstart rebel government. Given the importance of the subject matter at hand, what happens next will have critical implications for the entire world. That is why, today, we are going to cover a brief overview of the crisis and the January 12th operation, the asymmetry problem that the coalition is trying to overcome, whether there are any diversionary incentives in the West that underlie the strikes, the role that the United Nations played in it, whether this will be the end, and the problem that arises if it is not. But we begin with a brief background and overview of the attack on the Houthis. Information is still coming in on the operation, so bear in mind that what we know is likely to change after production of this video. The background was the broader Red Sea shipping crisis. We just covered this in depth earlier this very week, so check that video if you want a more complete story. Regardless, here is the basic idea of what's going on. Houthi rebels in Yemen, who control about this segment of the country, began attacking shipping routes off of those coastal waters, ostensibly as retaliation for Israel's operations in Gaza. This resulted in international condemnation, because further north is the Suez Canal, and because about $1 trillion of world trade per year passes through there. In December, the United States initiated Operation Prosperity Guardian, a perfectly American name for it, which built an international coalition meant to protect the shipping lanes. On January 3rd, the coalition issued a final warning to the Houthis. Cut it out, or else. However, Pretty soon on the frolic around and find out scale, we began to find out that the function does indeed strictly increase. One week later, the Houthis attempted their largest attack yet, targeting the USS Mason, the USS Laboon, the USS Eisenhower, and the HMS Diamond. Though the drones and missiles failed to reach their targets, the coalition had seen enough of that. January 12th local time, or January 11th back in the States, began a new phase of the conflict, with coalition strikes hitting land-based targets in Yemen. The kinetic participants were the United States and the United Kingdom, with additional support of unknown forms from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, and the Netherlands. It was a busy day because, at the time, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was also headed to Kyiv. Despite that, the United Kingdom contributed four Typhoon jets, flying in all the way from Cyprus, and dropping a series of 500-pound Paveway 4 bombs. Meanwhile, the United States launched FA-18s from its Eisenhower carrier to join in on the bombing runs, while other American ships fired Tomahawk cruise missiles. Sixteen distinct targets were hit within a handful of Houthi-controlled locations, including some within the capital. Installations included the houses of unmanned aerial vehicles and ballistic and cruise missiles, essentially the technology that the Houthis were using to target ships, the likely origin of which hints at the deeper problem here. Not that this is anything new. The previous file photo came from the era of Nikki Haley's tenure as United Nations Ambassador, and she is very busy doing other things right now. More on that general season in a moment. However, the strikes also hit the Houthis' coastal radar and air surveillance capabilities. This is important because it sets the stage for further attacks, if the coalition wishes to go in that direction. Okay, done with the background. As a starting point on the analysis, the main trouble that the West is facing is an asymmetry in the mode of attack. The proliferation of relatively inexpensive missiles and very cheap drones seems to put the Sea Guardians in an awkward spot. They are spending millions to defend each attack, while the Houthis are spending thousands to commit each attack. 
It sounds like a recipe for absolute disaster. And indeed, on the surface, when offense is easier than defense, it appears that the world becomes more unstable. This is definitely true in the extreme. Gods of war help us if a nuclear first strike could ever instantly win a conflict, because that is a very good way for someone to get an itchy trigger finger. By contrast, though, Houthi shipping attacks are much more modest. But if you want to deter attacks when the offense is favored, well, you cannot just keep hiding out and playing defense. You need to go on offense as well, in a domain that favors you instead. Thus, somewhat paradoxically, the offenses keep each other in check. At least until January 11th, the Houthis were not showing much concern about retaliation. Going forward, they will have to. And that is the basic idea of why the United States and the United Kingdom launched the strikes. Indeed, contrary to any domestic diversionary expectations, there is a lot of bipartisan agreement that the operation was a good idea for the participant countries as a whole. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell issued a statement that he welcomed the U.S. and coalition operations. Meanwhile, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson was also supportive. Actually, both indicated that they would like to see more done, not less. Trump, I think, also would have wanted to act sooner. Truth be told, I don't really know. That one is much harder to parse than the others. This is noteworthy because the United States is in an election year. And with that comes incentives to stir up conflicts and bask in rally-round-the-flag effects. It also comes at a time when the Biden administration is facing a minor scandal, after Secretary of State Lloyd Austin was hospitalized for four days, but failed to inform anyone, including the President and Congress. However, bipartisan support indicates that diversion was not at play here. The story is similar across the pond. Leader of the opposition Keir Starmer also voiced support for the operation. This connects to the United Nations' role in the saga. As of a few days ago, it appeared that there was deadlock within the Security Council on the issue. Russia and China have veto power within the chamber, and they did not seem keen on supporting any measures. This was despite how they both rely on the Suez Canal for international trade. Nevertheless, the Council adopted Resolution 2722 on January 10th, which called on the Houthis to cease attacks in the Red Sea. Despite their skepticism, Russia and China allowed the motion to go through by abstaining from the vote. This happens when a state with veto power believes that the alternative to some resolution would be even worse. Here, that appears to be a PR blitz from the West. The preparation for this included Secretary of State Antony Blinken traveling the region to increase the coalition's support, despite growing frustration in the region with Israel. Failure to budge risked making Russia and China look obstructionist at a time when the United States was committed to taking action. The concession that Russia and China won here was a very toned-down resolution, which now becomes the official position of the Security Council. It is worth noting that domestic rallies are stronger when they follow Security Council authorization, though the consequence here is nebulous because the resolution only condemns Houthi actions, without directly authorizing the kinetic response. Moving to the last puzzle for today, is this the end of the saga? Or is it just the first chapter in a new book? Suppose that the answer is that this is indeed the end. Then the onus is on explaining what the attack did to resolve whatever issue was causing the broader crisis in the first place. Sometimes the issues get resolved by default, because the other side has been militarily defeated. That is not the case here. The strikes were relatively minimal compared to what would happen in a real war with a full military conclusion. The optimistic outlook here, if you want this thing to end, is that the Houthis did not believe that the coalition was actually willing to escalate things this far. Talk is cheap, after all. Anyone can issue a press release with various threats. What separates the credible from the incredible is willingness to follow through. 
The strikes ought to have ended any questions that the Houthis had about the coalition's resolve. If that uncertainty drove the affair in the first place, then we can all go home very shortly. However, as we discussed last time, another interpretation here is that the Houthis are using the crisis as an advertisement for their cause. That being the case, they might wish to prolong the crisis so that the airwaves continue broadcasting their message. For their part, the Houthis are promising to retaliate. But this comes with the same skepticism as before. It is one thing for an actor to engage in cheap talk threats. It is another for them to actually follow through. The best we have in terms of a prediction market for this is oil exchanges. The price of Brent crude rose about $3 to $80 per barrel on news of the attack, though it started receding a little bit by the end of the following day. Still, that would seem to suggest that the initial market bet is on further short-term instability as a consequence of this. And that raises the problems of what happens next if the Houthis do respond. As we have discussed before, the trouble that the West faces here is twofold. First, much of the Houthis' valuable property that the United States and the United Kingdom would like to threaten to destroy was already taken care of by Saudi Arabia years ago as a part of the Saudi intervention into the Yemen civil war. In a traditional lines-on-maps framework, threatening higher costs pushes an opposing red line further back. Yep, we fit the lines in today. Well done. But the Houthis have already borne those costs, and so the United States can no longer use those types of threats for leverage. Second is the fact that the Houthis are an Iranian proxy, and so the likely source of the weapons is in Iran, not Yemen. And going after those sources would spiral this crisis into a much larger conflict. Still, Washington left open a clear next step on the ladder of escalation. So far, the coalition has only struck military targets. That leaves open the threat to go next to political targets, assuming that the Houthis want to go down a road that could take them there at all. Of course, that assumes that Iran does not force the Houthis to go down that road whether they want to or not. What do you think will happen next in the Red Sea? Let me know in the comments. If you want to know more about the broader conflict in the Middle East, check out this playlist on the subject. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.